Okay. I couldn't unmute myself, but here we are. <laughs> so we'll start the way we do each of these Wednesday nights with a, a practice period. And so just um, find yourself into a comfortable position that we can sit together for about a half an hour. And we'll begin this way. It generally feels nice to me just to take a few deep breaths, transitioning. And as the body settles into its own rhythm of breathing, you can just accept the way that it is. However the breathing feels, we just get to practice connecting, feeling, knowing. And remembering that the feeling tone, whether or not the breath, the knowing of the breath has a pleasant feeling or an unpleasant feeling, or maybe a feeling that's neither pleasant nor unpleasant that feels a bit neutral. Remembering that we can accept that. We don't need pleasant experiences to be aware. We don't need unpleasant experiences to go away in order to be practicing well. Just like we accept each in breath and each out breath as it comes, the force of nature it is. We accept each feeling that comes to this feeling of pleasant, this feeling of unpleasant, this feeling of neutral.
in this really simple way, we're not resisting life. We're not resisting nature. We're not resisting the imperfections of the heart. And with each contact, with each moment of contact with the present moment, the habit of mindfulness, the habit of mindful awareness, of wise and loving mindful awareness gets stronger, even if we don't notice that's happening. This heart grows in capacity to be intimate, to be here, to be awake, with the flow of life. And if it feels useful, we can stay here with the breath as long as we want. It's our discernment to make deciding what feels useful, what feels right for our practice in this moment. And if you want, you can drop the exclusive interest in the breath and open up to any experience that enters into awareness. Could be a sound, a body sensation, a thought, an emotion. You can cultivate this attitude of radical acceptance or radical love. It just says yes to whatever forces give birth to the arising of an experience. Oh, sounds being known. Emotions are being known. Maybe sleepiness is being known. 
All resistance and flavor of aversion is being known. Cultivating the same inclusive attitude of belonging to all experience. Trusting that it's safe enough to be intimate right here. Intimate with the flow of life. Not looking for a better experience or a better moment. Cultivating sincere acceptance of whatever shows up.
And you can open your eyes whenever you're ready. Thank you for your practice, everyone. We just stretch your body if you'd like to adjust. And also just take a moment to find a friendly face, look around, appreciate having other practitioners to sit with tonight. So I, so I'm Shelly Graff. I lead these Wednesday night practice groups. If anybody is new tonight, one of the teachers at Common Ground, and yeah, just glad to be here with you and share my practice with you tonight. Um, I'd like to continue with an exploration of belonging. Uh, I started talking about belonging at the Sunday morning practice group. I don't know if any of you were there. Some of you might have been. Mark was away leading a, well, not really away. He was at home, but leading a retreat uh, through Spirit Rock Meditation Center. And so I was on Sunday morning offering the program then and started to really um, talk about this idea of belonging and more specifically what it means to belong to each other. And it feels like such a interesting and complicated topic that I thought I'd spend some more time talking about the practice of learning how to belong to each other tonight and maybe for some upcoming weeks. We'll see how it goes tonight. And really, I'm wanting to talk about this because it's been such an interesting and a live exploration for me. So part of what I find um, enlivening about teaching and sharing, more sharing, is the authenticity. Yeah, it's that that I'm interested in. So the authenticity of the teacher in the teaching role or the sharing role or the leadership role and the, yeah, real, what that means for me is just being willing to be a student learner in front of a group of other student learners. So modeling for you what a sincere exploration looks like of a topic that is really interesting to me and feels very important at a time like this. So my hope for you, and I keep saying this each week, but I really hope that you'll be a good student, just like I'm, uh, modeling what it means to be a good student. I'm hoping you'll find a way to be a student tonight and to not just accept the things that I'm saying or my reflections as truth, but as offering um, something that I have been working with and perhaps that you can work with even tonight. So tracking your own experience, even as you're receiving the words, and really taking it in and then using it after tonight, using the words, using the reflections to in some way to support your own learning. So you might remember something, a phrase, a word or two, or maybe more, or maybe nothing, but you'll just remember the topic. And so then you just take that up as a good student 
and explore what that means. Maybe you know a lot, maybe you know a little, but we can start right now together, exploring as good students of life, as good students of Dharma. And I see those things as the same, really. Good student of Dharma is a good student of life. So what does it mean to belong in this life that we're living right now as Dharma students, as meditation students, mindfulness students? And I chose this topic of belonging because I'm really invested in, um, and I intend to keep staying invested in, do my work so I can continue to be invested in understanding uh, racial conditioning, understanding racism, understanding whiteness. So I want to say something um, in terms of belonging that helps us reckon with the, uncomfort the uncomfortable reality and the deadly reality of racism. And so already as I'm saying this, it feels important just to acknowledge that, you know, just in the beginning, Right now, as I'm practicing and sharing even a little introduction of what I hope to share tonight, I already feel a sense of belonging. It as it's my words, the uttering of words, is actually cultivating a sense of responsibility to you. Like, so I'm getting a taste of what it means to belong even now. Responsible to you to share something that might be useful and receiving the kindness of your presence as support for me, you know, even just your gaze, like, okay, I'm realizing that there's a something mutual that's happening here. And it might be easier for me to say in this white-bodied experience to feel, to tap into the sense of belonging. So it's important to name that too, that I come to this practice, this exploration with a lot of privilege in my life. The topic of belonging is really complex. Um, and if it doesn't feel complex, it's probably because there's something that we're not seeing or much that we're not seeing. Our views and opinions and beliefs tend to interfere with our intentions to realize a sense of belonging. The woundedness of our lives tends to interfere right, in how we relate to that, those experiences of woundedness. Pre previously will we'll come back in, in a, with some strength when we have this intention to tap into a sense of belonging. It's much the same way that our um, experiences, our life really comes into full bloom in a moment, no matter what our intentions are. We might be sitting down with an intention to practice, to understand loving kindness and all we see is attachment. Right. We might be intending to practice compassion, and yet our heart is full of anger, or rage, something like this. So part of this, uh, part of this, our growing or developing or cultivating our capacity for belonging is really understanding that everything belongs. Right? So we might feel, we might have this intention to understand belonging, but yet everything but that comes up. And that's okay because that's where we begin. That's actually the practice right there for us. My partner and I were driving home from uh, Michigan where we were with her family for many weeks, seven weeks or so, and just coming home on Saturday and a long, a long drive, 10 hours or so. And um, during one part of the drive, we were talking about this topic and um, we drove down a road and saw many geese that were presumably hit by motorists. So some on the road and some on the side of the road. And in this, this moment, it was kind of heartbreaking to just feel the impact of human, human life and animal life and how uh, dishonoring we can be at times of the animal of the animal world. And remembering, then I was remembering all of the times that in Minneapolis when mm -hmm. driving through North Minneapolis, there's 
a lot of turkeys over there and how many times I've been stopped and or stopped for turkeys. And also remembering how um, I quickly, like a day before that, my dog was having some inner experience that I didn't understand. And while we were in the front yard and she darted out into traffic and I left in front of the uh, oncoming traffic and waved them down without even hesitation. But in my partner's wisdom, she said, yeah, we don't have the same kind of honoring for black people in this Western culture. In fact, she said, we treat them like insects. And what do we do with insects when they're coming into our space and we don't want them there? We just kill them, right? So realizing a sense of belonging and feeling into a sense of belonging includes all of these moments in our lives when we reckon with um, our own bad behavior or the behavior that we um, have that promotes a sense of not belonging, that keeps us uh, feeling, uh, feeling into a sense of separateness or uh, more individuality than interconnection. And it really seems that in this time, this is, this is the reckoning of racism. This is the reckoning of whiteness, that we're coming face to face with these ways that we have rules for how, who, who and what is included into our sphere of belonging and who and what is excluded into our sphere of belonging. So this question of how I how how do we realize belonging? You know, this is the practice. This is this is the path that we're on. It's not a straightforward answer. It's more of an art form that we get to explore and you know work our way through. So some of the teachings that feel really relevant to me as I explore a sense of belonging. Be what it means to belong is this uh, teaching about karma. So karma, or I'm not going to go into it too much, but we can simplify the teaching on karma to mean a cause and effect, the understanding of cause and effect, that in intentional actions create a result, and that, and that impacts every moment again and again and again. So just a simple example, I was sitting in front of the window in my living room this morning, kind of preparing for this, what I might say to you, and just noticing the wind and realizing that how many forces influence the wind, right? And my relationship to the wind. So there's this causality of lots of forces that influence the wind. And then what I do in relationship to the wind, open the windows, shut the windows, go outside, come inside, do something to prevent windiness, to support windiness. Right? There's always this participation that we're, this particip we always are participating in cause and effect in our actions, in our engagement, in our, or in our lack of engagement. And our, you know, our body's activities, our ability to breathe, this isn't a force of nature also. And what we do to take care of our bodies, you know, has an impact on how we live and how we contribute to our, our lives and the lives of each other. One of the ways that I um, 
feel into a sense of longing. It takes some practice, but just realizing that the in breath and the, and the out breath, this inhale and the exhale, are also are all contributing factors to our interconnection. Right. So I'm we're breathing. We're really breathing in the same air. And the air isn't just here in my neighborhood or in my home, but this air is something that we share communally, not and not even just here in Minneapolis or in Minnesota, but air is, you know, air currents are flowing all over the world. So just bringing that to mind as a as a recollection has been a powerful thing sitting here in my home with other people or sometimes even right now on Zoom and realizing, oh, we're all participating, we're all contributing just by the simple act of breathing in and breathing out. And then another, another way that I practice living into a sense of belonging is by reflecting on ancestry. So I've shared this little practice that I have done before, um, and that is just in meditation, imagining myself as an as a baby as a fetus growing in my mother's stomach and all of the forces of my mom's life at that time you know i some i know and some i don't know i know a little bit about how she was living and um what she was doing and just thinking about all of the moments in my own life that have an impact on this heart so moments the, the ordinary and the profound and the relational and you know, all of these moments that the body just, you know, even now moving my arms, right? This is influencing my, my own life, a simple thing. And my mom did all of this all the time. And so just having a, a very global sense of all of the forces that impacted her, that then impacted me growing in her, growing in her stomach. And then taking that a step back and going like, okay, and then my mom was once an, an, an a fetus, right, growing in someone's stomach. And then my my grandmother was once growing in someone's belly. And then her grandmother, her mother, and her, you know, and on and on and on. So feeling a sense of like, oh, I'm responsible through each of these lives. Ancestry is actually alive right here. History is alive right here in this body. And it helps me understand that the actions I take, the contributions that I make to our own collective well-being, right, are in some ways uh, responsible to and belonging to history and contributing to the next generation, children, teenagers, young people. They will all reap the impact i don't want to say completely the benefits because they will re reap the com inherit right the impact of our collective actions so this sense of responsibility to and responsibility for is important in our understanding of belonging right on a real practical level it makes it clear to me how oh we are really interconnected and whether or not we believe it or not whether or not we know it in a single moment, it, it's true that our lives are interconnected and we belong to each other. So when we realize our interconnection, we realize that uh, we can use our Dharma practice to heal the wounds of history, practicing for ourselves and for others. And this seems like the healing that we need now. So this question I have of what am I doing to plant in this heart the seeds of belonging rather than the seeds of separation on a daily basis, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis? What am I doing to feel into, to cultivate a sense, a felt sense of belonging? Because it's more than an intellectual idea. Whiteness has actually stripped us of our embodiment, right? And this is true for all of us, regardless of our racial conditioning. You know, brown bodies, black bodies, white bodies, we breathe in this 
culture, this whiteness, this white supremacy culture here in the United States. And so an aspect of white supremacy culture is this disembodied, highly intellectual um, priority. And so reconnecting learning as, as meditators, we have something to say here because we, this is our practice, reconnecting with our bodies and being able to feel into a sense of what it means to be interconnected right here. Yeah, that's a, an important, it's an important practice moment to moment, not an easy one. And for all kinds of reasons, right? Not just because of whiteness, but because of our, the realities of our, you know, previous experiences. And our identity certainly influence that, our trauma history, you know, our gender, or sexual orientation, or queerness, you know, all has a impact on our uh, capacities to feel into, to feel, to, to be embodied, right? So we gotta be really gentle with ourselves as we encounter, as we, make our way through this practice of learning how to belong. And somehow it might be just, you know, the only thing that we can do in moments just to feel like, oh, I, I know I have a body and that's about it, right? That's, that's where I begin. So the process of decolonizing the mind is reclaiming our bodies, belonging to our bodies, knowing that our, belong, our bodies belong to us. And when we can feel like we have a reverence, an honor, a, a connection with this body, then it makes it possible to actually connect with other bodies. Yeah, it max, makes it actually possible to stop for turkeys or for geese and to not hunt black people. But we have to do this work. We have to do this work of um, inhabiting our bodies. The Buddha, the Buddha, one of the teachings that, um, one of the teachings I wanted to talk a little bit about today and connect it to a sense of belonging is the teaching of Sangha. It's a, the Buddha taught us that there are three worthwhile refuges, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And so the Buddha, this capacity for us all to be intimate, to know, right, this capacity of this mind, this heart mind to be awake, and the Dhamma to be awake to truth with the support of each other. Buddha, who knows Dhamma, embedded in Sangha. And the Buddha and the Dhamma have been um, highlighted a lot in teachings here in Western convert Buddhist communities. And um, perhaps Sangha, not so much, but really, you know, teachers like Larry Yang, who have spent a lot of time teaching on belonging and, um, and Sangha, and other teachers um, that I've studied with and practiced with and perhaps you have too. So following their lead and really learning how to um, do what the Buddha suggested and take refuge in Sangha. The Buddha said that just as in the great ocean there is but one taste, the taste of salt, so in this doctrine and discipline there is but one taste, the taste of freedom. One taste the taste of freedom. So if there's but one taste, one liberative taste, one taste of liberation in all of the teachings, what is the taste of liberation that is in the teaching of Sangha? It's not a good question. What is the taste of liberation in this teaching of Sangha, or we might say in this teaching of learning how to belong to each other, 
of learning how learning of leaning into and learning about our interconnection of learning how we're responsible to each other responsible to support each other now sangha is typically translated as community so and and the buddha you know delineated between um, the monastic community and the lay community and so this community of sangha or practitioners who are waking up to the truth of things one definition is a community community that joins and lives together so people humans that are waking up who who have this capacity to wake up to the truth of things we can expand our idea of sangha to include the entire world so human human beings is there anybody that doesn't have the capacity to wake up to the truth of things well if we say no to that then the whole world is our sangha right a community that joins and lives together we are interconnected another definition of sangha people are things that are intent on a constructive goal so it is striking to me that and probably to many of you that this idea of sangha this connection with belonging is complicated right because probably for you as it is for me i'm aware of even as i say these words and as i was preparing this talk the same thing that we don't have a global sense of belonging and it's something that we it would be worthwhile for us to work towards the last talk i gave i um spoke to a a friend of color after the talk and they were there and they very wisely reminded me that um that all of all what they said is like my my lived experience and those of almost all black people in america constantly informs us that we don't belong and we deserve to be murdered, violated, tormented, taunted. So coming back into a sense of wholeness, belonging is coming back into a sense of wholeness. You know, feeling the aliveness of belonging, of learning how to belong. I'm reading a great new book it just came out just put in a good word for it for Lama Rod Owen I pre-ordered it and it just came in the mail 2 days ago um it's called Love and Rage the Path of Liberation Through Anger it's uh, wonderful and edgy and I would highly recommend it and one of the things Lama Rod said in this book is <clears throat> and the thing about white colonialist fear and rage is that i have nothing to do with it but my body still becomes a receptacle for this unmetabolized woundedness at the end of the day i find myself hauling and not just my trauma but also the trauma of whiteness so this metabolizing the conditions that have been seeded by the actions and the karmic impact of our of all of our previous moments right and it's perhaps um okay right maybe a little easier to understand why a black gay man would say this and also in this white bodied experience it's my job to reckon with the loss of the losses in this life too so it's not just a loss or an impact for people of color but it's also whiteness 
and the result of the karmic result of racism over centuries is also a, a significant loss to white body people too. And there, you know, we're a community of differences, aren't we? Some of the losses that I feel into are the loss of um, the loss of embodiment, like I mentioned before, and also the loss of intimacy. Like in, in my experience, it is difficult to be in relationship, to be an authentic relationship, authentic and deeply trusting relationship with people of color, um, because because of this white-bodied experience, even the the people that are the most dear to me, most intimate in my life, it's a significant loss to feel into like, oh, there's a sense of mistrust here and I can feel that. And perhaps it will remain. And it's my job, it's our job, it's my job to partner in the reckoning with that, the reckoning of that reality. Tara Brock said, for a child to feel belonging, they need to feel understood and loved. We each feel a fundamental sense of connectedness when we are seen and when what is seen is held in love. We habitually relate to our inner life in the same way that others attended to us. When our parents and the larger culture don't respond to our fears, are too preoccupied to really listen to our needs or send messages that we are falling short, then we adopt similar ways of relating to our own being. We disconnect and banish parts of our inner life. So in this reckoning with belonging and realizing our interconnection, it, it involves some very tough, it will involve some tough moments, complicated moments of learning how to um, accept and honor and witness the collective losses, the collective trauma that we've experienced. It's almost like, it feels like we're at a, a place in, in life right now where we're asked to be, uh, we're asked to be born. It's like a birthing process. And the process of being birthed is not easy. Babies come out often screaming and figuring out what the hell happened and what am I doing now and who are my people and am I safe? Am I going to be protected? You know, all of these good questions. And so here we are in a similar moment. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we're being asked to reimagine Sangha and to think outside the box about what it takes to have a sense of belonging. Another friend of mine, another uh, a friend of color, was telling me a day or two ago that they have really been appreciating spending time in uh, BIPOC spaces and have been doing so exclusively these days. And what they have been feeling um, is a sense of experimenting, right? Dropping, feeling the capacity in spaces where they feel safe enough to drop the need to be perfect or to be right, but just to experiment, be a, a student. And so for, for each of us, we might have to um, lean into what it means to be resourced. 
And perhaps that might mean finding um, a sense of safety or protection in spaces where we can let down some of the um, tenants of whiteness, really where the system knows how to let go. It might be true for people of color, that also might be true for white people. I was listening to a 10% happier podcast today. Spring Washam was on uh, talking about uh, a new class that she's teaching um, called the Dharma of Harriet Tubman. And she was talking like in her very alive way, talking about the importance of jokes and laughter for balancing right now. So in order to feel into the truth of our collective trauma and the collective losses, we have to find ways to uh, stay balanced, right? And so talking and laughing and joking is good medicine. And so trusting our inner guidance as to when that might be really useful. Also singing and chanting or doing rituals feel really grounding to me. Um, bowing practice. If you were here at the Dhamma Among Us conversation with Young O and uh, Jessica Mori, they took us through some bowing practice that was so mm -hmm. life-giving for me, and grounding. As is chanting and singing, it actually has a way of resourcing the nervous system. So it's encouraging you to explore all of the options available to you. And you're probably like me, um, consuming news and written material and um, so just wanting to share a little bit about my process and how I'm doing this. Um, it, and also, and just that I'm appreciating the process, like the spiritual practice of consumption these days, like asking my mind, my mind, my heart, deepest wisdom to show up for me and asking the ancestral forces to be there with me as I lean into this um, new reality, right? And one of the things that I've been um, interested in learning about and understanding is the movement to defund the police. And I'm actually, you know, no matter where you stand, no matter how you feel about that right now, I'm it, engaging it as a spiritual practice, engaging the process of consuming and understanding as a spiritual practice feels really useful. So reading material and listening to what people have to say, people of color especially have to say about this um, possibility that's, you know, moving. It feels like the, the, the act of surrendering to a, a birthing process, like a new, something that we don't know. Ah, imagining a, a new reality. So as a spiritual practice, it feels really familiar to me to be sitting on my cushion, for example, practicing letting go of all of my expectations about what this moment should be like, surrendering to the way things really are, not pretending about the way things are, not, and, the, and trusting that this mind has the capacity to be with the truth, to not pretend, right? To feel the fear that's interfering with my capacity to know the breath and to, to know all of this. And so this possibility of tuning into the waves of political and social discourse that we're hearing with that same attitude of mind, like, oh, this is a birthing process, learning how to belong to each other, receive the information, and surrender to not knowing, and yet finding a way forward, committing to our engagement, because remembering that our participation is always gonna be there in our silence or our engagement. So committing to the understanding because it is an act of participation, 
it is an act of engagement. So the spiritual practice, this, my spiritual practice really is informing my capacity to be with the flow of social and political discourse that we're, that we are all swimming in. Okay. Thank you for listening. I'll, uh, I'll keep sharing my reflections in upcoming weeks. So if you're interested in this topic, please come back. <laughs>